thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you today and for tolerating our terrible sense of humor in the keynote title. My name is Camille Francois. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Graphica. And today I am joined by my colleagues, Melanie Smith, our Head of Analysis, and Erin Macawini, our Senior Research Analyst. Over the past six months, we have spent a lot of time exploring all the online conversations surrounding the pandemic and the responses to the pandemic. And we wanted to share a few highlights from this work and a few lessons learned on how to apply a network mapping approach to infodemiology. Infodemiology here, of course, being the art and science of addressing infodemics. So let's start with a simple question. What is network mapping? Network mapping is the way by which we analyze and visualize how information travels online. Where did this information originate? How did it travel from one community to another? How are the communities who are sharing this information structured, both internally and in relationship to one another? How do filter bubbles play out and how messages break through or not in the different parts of the internet? And how does algorithmic amplification accelerate the propagation of certain information in the public sphere? And finally, how can we understand the different techniques that help manipulate the spread of certain pieces of information? And so when we look at misinformation and disinformation, we look at it as a network information problem. Often people try to analyze what's happening online simply looking at volume. What's loud today? What's going viral? Is this information more shared than that information? And that's interesting, but it's also very limiting because to fully understand and respond to online events, you need to reveal the underlying network structures behind these conversations. Otherwise, it would be like city officials trying to solve traffic jams, but without a map of the highways and simply using how loud the car horns are in order to decide where to intervene, which of course would not be a very efficient approach. So our team does cartography. We basically draw maps of the internet and they look like that. This is a map of the online conversation around the flatten the curve hashtag. We made it in March in order to understand who was engaging with that campaign at that time. Each dot on this map is a social media account. The size of the dot represents the amount of attention that this network is getting from the rest of this specific network. So it is not a measure of abstract influence. It really is a measure of the in-network influence. You can have plenty of followers online, but not in the community that you're interested in. And you can see that all these dots, all these accounts, they form distinct communities. And this is what the colors are showing. This is because this is how people organize on the internet. And therefore the map here is revealing the different communities who are engaging with this flat and the curve conversation around the globe. In many ways, it illustrates a public health campaign that has been successful. You can see key public officials acting as influencers on this entire network, like the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau or the Chief Medical Officer of Ireland. But you can also see various grassroots communities who are spreading this message. For instance, the pro-Palestine social activists. This is an organic spread, which in our world means that it is not driven by bots, not driven by trolls, or not driven by paid accounts and ads. This is simply real people sharing information with their peers. That information, usually in this map, comes from verified public health accounts, and it's getting traction alongside other hashtags like social distancing, stay at home, stay at home and save lives, and stop the spread. And so overall, that's a pretty good news map. It's nice to look at. But of course, and as you can guess, not all of our work on COVID-19 conversation look like that. And a lot of what we've seen surrounding the pandemic conversations online show a quite different reality. Right, Erin? 
Yes, that is right, Camille. Uh, so with the methods that Camille just described, we have tracked the COVID-19 infodemic since January. We did this with a time series of mappings based on the use of COVID-related hashtags on Twitter. Each map that I'm going to show you is a monthly snapshot of the COVID conversation and the communities that participated in it. The maps that you see on the screen are global, but track with countries specifically where the rates of COVID-19 infection have accelerated month to month and participation online accordingly spiked. Unfortunately, we observed problematic communities sharing conspiracies and health misinformation as early as in our first map in January. While the COVID-19 topic was new to them, the communities that were engaging with and amplifying COVID-19 mis and disinformation did not arise overnight. These are established political and pseudoscience conspiracy communities like anti-vax and QAnon, for example. They are often fringe communities that are partial to alternative, unreliable, and often politicized news sources. We've also historically seen these groups use algorithmic manipulation and amplification to spread their content. Over these months, we saw this machinery fully refocused to produce and communicate solely on the impact of the pandemic and the different government responses. It's clear that organized pre-existing networks became COVID-19 networks and very quickly. When a new piece of COVID-19 information surfaced, a group would put its established ideological spin on it. So for example, with the well-known Gates conspiracy, anti-vax groups would focus on mandatory vaccination while political conspiracy groups would emphasize the plandemic, the conspiracy that the pandemic was a man-made virus being used for nefarious government plots. While doing this work of fitting new information into their worldview, these groups organized their own parallel networks of information. For example, let's look at this February map. The accounts following health and science-based news are highlighted, but equal in size and just as central to this map are accounts that follow problematic COVID-19 news sites. And when we dive deeper into this cluster, we find popular accounts that became medical influencers with no medical background and entire websites and blogs that are fully dedicated to pumping out unreliable and sensational COVID-19 news. There are also political accounts that are rebranding to be COVID-19 news accounts, which is a phenomenon seen all around the world. For example, take a Gilets jaunes Facebook page in France, which happened to be called Countdown Until Macron's Removal. But overnight, it became fully dedicated to hydroxychloroquine and changed its name to simply being Coronavirus COVID News. These centrally located accounts that make up this COVID-19 news cluster bridge to more fringe conspiratorial clusters like the far-right conspiracists highlighted on the map. Digging into these conspiratorial groups, I observed the rampant spread of homebrew trackers, as opposed to popular trackers like the John Hopkins, which is made with rigorous data. For example, one user tweeted out their personal investigation using a weather tracking site, windy.com, and satellite imagery to claim that there were rising sulfide dioxide rates in Wuhan. Although the investigation was flawed and had been debunked, the tweet thread was shared virally in one day across our COVID-19 map, and at least two news outlets covered the story as if it was real. The reliance on personal investigations and alternative data sources points to the deep mistrust in statistics and health data reporting. We observe this familiar machinery build networks of alternative coronavirus information. In fact, these are well-organized networks that have been vocal on health topics and conspiratorial topics for years. We're not looking at scattered pieces of bad information that are naturally occurring in a vacuum here and there. We're looking at a well-organized machinery that has sowed doubt in the health establishment for years and laid ground for viral misinformation to spread when this pandemic hit. So I've painted a bleak picture, but that isn't to say there is not really important work that's being done by scientific and public health organizations. This includes organizations like the WHO and CDC, which form a critical part of the counter response to this well-oiled disinformation machine I just showed you. 
And by now you probably know where I'm going. I'm going to show you another map. So here's a map of the WHO network. These are accounts that follow WHO and it's a mirror of sorts of what we've seen previously. It shows the communities most engaged with the WHO and its messages on social media. We can even play somewhat of a game of Where's Waldo because a lot of your accounts probably show up in this network as you're highly likely to follow WHO on Twitter. The map shows there are strong networks structured around the dissemination of science-based public health information. And I'm happy to say over the last six months, the role of health organizations in our networks of coronavirus conversation have solidified. They've also become much more central to the mainstream conversation around COVID-19. Our maps here tell us public health communication gained more traction in a broader and broader audience over time. Yet we all know that COVID-19 mis and disinformation continues to spread. There is still an information landscape that encourages the consumption of problematic healthcare information, despite this increase of science-based groups in the maps. This here is a map of the WHO followers and the overlap between our COVID-19 conspiratorial maps. Clearly, WHO is reaching people that prefer science-based health information. But this almost non-existent overlap that you see shows us that entire communities of people aren't being reached yet. There are plenty of pockets of people online who prefer the alternative information networks and WHO is still not reaching these groups. We have learned that facts aren't going to cure the infodemic alone. Expertise alone will not change minds and reach the communities that need it most. This is a complex problem, but the good news is that it isn't a particularly unique problem and that there is expertise that can be leveraged to tackle it. So for that, I am going to send it over to Melanie. Thanks, Erin. We usually spend a lot of time explaining concepts like contagion and clusters when we talk about our network maps, and it's really nice to not have to do that with this audience. But epidemiology analogies do fall short when it comes to helping us understand and navigate infodemics. And this is largely because of the differences in the structural environments and the threats that these two fields are concerned with. Viruses do not manufacture external circumstances or consciously seek and target vulnerable populations, but disinformation actors do. Once again, it's not about volume, and that's not what allows them to be successful here, is the networks that they create and maintain. These networks over time become fully dedicated to curating echo chambers that are resistant to scientific information. I've seen this in many contexts with communities, for instance, that refute the evidence of chemical attacks in war zones or with those that vehemently reject any evidence of climate change. Not only is it important to understand the network that exists here, it's also important to unpack the narratives at play. So in each of these networks, there are geographic communities that allow for the tailoring of myths and disinformation narratives that make them more salient for their local audiences. For example, one of the most popular misinformation narratives around COVID-19 has been 5G. In this case, actors leveraged existing fears about the technology in countries like Nigeria and South Africa, which are highlighted in the map here. Whereas in the US and the UK, Existing disenfranchisement with government responses to COVID-19 exacerbated perceptions of danger. And these theories were driven into the mainstream by celebrities like Woody Harrelson and Wiz Khalifa. Also vital to study here the obstacles that are preventing public health information from finding its target audience. In other words, you can't properly understand an infodemic without taking into account the smear campaigns against individuals and institutions that typically deliver public health information. These smear campaigns can target organizations like the WHO or individuals who get roped into conspiracy theories such as Fauci, Gates or Soros. And by drawing these individuals into the COVID-19 framing, actors that propagate disinformation have been allowed to capitalize upon large and receptive audiences. For example, certain online communities have long believed that Gates is trying to actively depopulate the world. By exploiting a tenuous link between Gates and COVID-19, Purveyors of disinformation have been able to draw the communities who already believed Gates to be nefarious further into conspiracy. Therefore, while it's true that public health entities have become more central to the conversation around COVID-19, especially in recent months, 
The online discussion about them originates from clusters of conspiracy accounts and mainstream ones in equal measure. So what do we do about this? In order to mount an effective response to the infodemic, there needs to be an acceptance that certain communities within this network will neither be reached nor swayed by a response. But the good news is that there are broad swathes of engaged social media users who remain open to both good and bad information. The potential cumulative impact of inoculating those that are still swayable cannot be underestimated. We need to be just as skilled as those working against us at A, identifying the populations at risk, B, the narratives that resonate with them, and C, those best placed to deliver them. In order to achieve that, it's essential to draw upon the collective experience of a number of different fields that have successfully tackled bad information environments. This collaboration provides a better understanding of the problem and improves our chances of finding a solution. And so we covered a few things, but let me leave you with a few high level takeaways. The first one is when we consider myths and disinformation, we are not looking at scattered pieces of bad information that are just occurring in a vacuum here and there. Instead, we are looking at dedicated, well-organized networks that are pumping out bad information very fast, loudly, and with global reach. This means that facts are not going to cure the infodemic alone and expertise alone will not change the hearts and minds and reach the communities that need it most. Approaching the infodemic like a pandemic will also only get us so far. Epidemiology metaphors will fall short for an infodemic when we consider the bad actors that manipulate the information environment and the effects of amplification manipulations and algorithms. This is not an unsolvable problem, but it is one that requires a formal and interdisciplinary method to analyze and navigate. I hope that we earned our stripes today and managed to convince you that this is possible and that we can work towards it together. Thank you again so much for having us.